Part 1. You will hear a phone conversation between a lady and a salesperson at a computer store. First you will have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. Good morning, Computer Solutions. Oh, hello. My printer's broken and I need to get a new one. Someone gave me your number and I was wondering whether you could help me. No problem. We stock printers suitable for both home and office. Well, I'm a student. I just need one for my coursework. How much do they cost? An inkjet printer will probably be good enough for what you want. It'll do text and pictures. They start at £80 and go up to £250. Mmm, quite a good price range then. I can spend about £150. Can I get a good one for that? Yes. I'd go for the Trion i860. It had good reviews and we've had no complaints about it. The I-860. I'll come in and have a look. What time are you open to? Normally we close at 5.30, but today being Saturday, it's 8.30. And where exactly are you? In Hollow Ridge, 15 Park Lane. 15 Park Lane. Got that. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions. Is that in the town centre? Yes, opposite the cinema. OK. And is it easy to park? If I buy the printer, I'd want to take it home with me today. No problem. There's a car park quite near, just at the back of the supermarket. OK. Oh, one more thing. Do you take credit cards? Cash only, I'm afraid. Will that be all right? Yes, but I mustn't forget to go to the bank before I come. Oh, by the way, what's your name? Jack Stanway. That's S-T-A-N-W-A-Y. There are two Jacks here, so when you ask for me, give my surname too. OK, I will. I work in the office, but you need to go to the third floor where the printers are. Just ask for me there and I'll come out and see what I can do to help. See you later. The third floor. Great. Thanks for your help. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear from a manager of an engineering company giving a speech to his new trainees. 
First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Ah, good morning everyone. My name's Jeremy Armstrong and I'm in charge of your training programme here at Coppersmith Engineering, manufacturers of what we like to think are the world's best diesel engines. I'll start by giving you a very brief background to the company. Right, now the founder, John Coppersmith, was born locally in 1910. In 1932, he started making bicycles in a shed at the bottom of his garden. This proved so successful that two years later, he rented a small factory unit and set up Coppersmith Engineering. So, we date back to 1934. And since then, we've produced over 10 million engines. As you probably know, the engines we manufacture are not for cars, but for vehicles used in industry and agriculture. In the last few years, we've also made engines that are used to power boats, including police launches and lifeboats. Another fairly new development is that 10 years ago, we set up a joint venture with a Japanese manufacturer, and as a result, we're seeing a big rise in turnover, while keeping production costs steady. Of course, this success gives us great confidence in the future, and so we're currently in the middle of a five-year plan to improve the buildings we have here. We've just completed a new test facility, and uh, as you were coming in, you probably noticed the site where we're constructing an office block. At present, our desk-based staff are in several buildings, and they're all due to move into the new one in six months' time. Oh, and uh, just one more point I'd like to mention. Our goal has always been to achieve top quality in everything we do. So, when we received an award last month from the City Council, naming us Best Employer, we were very proud indeed. Before you hear the rest of what the manager has to say, you will get some time to look at questions 16 to 20. OK, now I'll give you an idea of what to expect in the next few days. You'll each be spending today and tomorrow with one of our staff, following him or her around, sitting in on meetings, and generally learning about that particular activity. Now, this is how I've allocated you. Uh, Carol, you said in your interview that you're interested in finance. So, I've put you with a person who deals with payments to staff. This is the busiest week in the monthly cycle, as all the overtime has to be calculated before payday. Now, Frank, I believe you've already had some training in sales, and you want to look at the process from the other side, so the purchasing section is where you'll start off. You'll be able to find out how we buy goods and services from our suppliers. Next on the list is Philip. You said you hoped to work in advertising, so I had arranged for you to work alongside our marketing manager. But I'm afraid she's on sick leave at the moment, so instead you'll be with someone who deals with sales to other countries. As you speak two or three languages, you should find you can use them. Stephanie, you didn't mention any preference, so... I've put you with a warehouse manager. We purchase goods almost every day and have frequent deliveries, so you'll see how we handle all the goods that come in. 
and not to mention the finished products waiting to be dispatched to customers. And lastly, Min, I understand you've been working in an employment agency and would like to look at the application process from an employer's point of view. We're about to advertise for new training staff to join my section, so you'll be with the person who's responsible for recruiting them. You might have some good ideas for how they should go about it. OK, now, if you'd like to come this way... I'll... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear from a psychology student, Joanna, discussing with her supervisor about her research in music and psychology. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Hi, Joanna. Good to meet you. Now, before we discuss your new research project, I'd like to hear something about the psychology study you did last year for your master's degree. So, how did you choose your subjects for that? Well, I had six subjects, all professional musicians and all female. Three were violinists, and there was also a cello player and a pianist and a flute player. They were all very highly regarded in the music world and they'd done quite extensive tours in different continents and quite a few had won prizes and competitions as well. Mm. And they were quite young, weren't they? Yes, between 25 and 29. Um, the mean was 27.8. I wasn't specifically looking for artists who'd produced recordings, but this is something that's just taken for granted these days and they all had. Right. Now, you collected your data through telephone interviews, didn't you? Yes. I realised if I was going to interview leading musicians, it'd only be possible over the phone because they're so busy. I recorded them using a telephone recording adapter. I'd been worried about the quality, but it worked out all right. I managed at least a 30-minute interview with each subject, sometimes longer. Did doing it on the phone make it more stressful? I'd thought it might. Um, it was all quite informal, though, and in fact they seemed very keen to talk. And I don't think using the phone meant I got less rich data. Rather the opposite, in fact. Interesting. And you were looking at how performers dress for concert performances? That's right. Uh, my research investigated the way players see their role as a musician, and how this is linked to the type of clothing they decide to wear. But that focus didn't emerge immediately. When I started, I was more interested in trying to investigate the impact of what was worn on those listening, and also whether someone like a violinist might adopt a different style of clothing from, say, someone playing the flute or the trumpet. Hmm. It's interesting that the choice of dress is up to the individual, isn't it? Yes. You'd expect there to be rules about it in orchestras, but that's quite rare. Before you hear the rest of the recording, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30.
You only had women performers in your study.、Mm -hmm. Was that because male musicians are less worried about fashion? I think a lot of the men are very much influenced by fashion, but in social terms, the choices they have are more limited. They'd really upset audiences if they strayed away from quite narrow boundaries.、Mm. Now, popular music has quite different expectations.、Uh, did you read Mike Frost's article about the dress of women performers in popular music? No. Well, he points out that a lot of female singers and musicians in popular music tend to dress down in performances. And wear less feminine clothes,、um, like jeans instead of skirts.、Uh, and he suggests this is because otherwise they'd just be discounted as trivial. But you could argue they're just wearing what's practical. I mean, a pop music concert is usually a pretty energetic affair. Yes, he doesn't make that point, but I think you're probably right. I was interested by the effect of the audience at a musical performance when it came to the choice of dress. The subjects I interviewed felt this was really important.、Mm. It's all to do with what we understand by performance as a public event. They believed the audience had certain expectations, and it was up to them as performers to fulfil these expectations to show a kind of esteem. They weren't afraid of looking as if they'd made an effort to look good.、Mm. I think in the past the audience would have had those expectations of one another too. But that's not really the case now. Not in the UK, anyway. No. And I also got interested in what sports scientists are doing too with regard to clothing. Musicians are quite vulnerable physically, aren't they? Because the movements they carry out are very intensive and repetitive.、Mm. So I'd imagine some features of sports clothing could safeguard the players from the potentially dangerous effects of this sort of thing. Yes. But musicians don't really consider it. They avoid clothing that obviously restricts their movements, but that's as far as they go. Anyway, coming back to your own research, do you have any idea where you're going from here? I was thinking of doing a study using an audience, including. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture about crocodiles. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. This week we're going to be looking at some creatures with a ferocious reputation: the crocodile. The largest species of crocodile in the world is the saltwater or estuarine crocodile, which can be found in Southeast Asia and, more especially, in northern Australia. This crocodile is the largest living reptile in the world, bar none. It can weigh up to 900 kilos, and as for length. The average maximum size for males is around five meters. However, the largest crocodile ever recorded was 6.2 meters, and this croc was killed by poachers in Papua New Guinea in 1983. It used to be thought that crocodiles would grow indefinitely until they died, hence producing very large, very old crocodiles. However, there's some doubt over this now, and it's likely that maximum size is instead influenced by inherited characteristics and by the environment. Few individuals seem predisposed towards very large sizes, even if all the conditions are right. Crocodiles are very sophisticated creatures. 
They can float or sink at will, finely tuning their buoyancy. In this way, they resemble a submarine. The liver is squeezed back to make more room for the expanded lungs. While submerged, they can stay under for up to two hours. A protective membrane closes over their eyes like swimming goggles. Crocodiles feed on a large variety of prey, such as small mammals, birds, and even domestic livestock. They have very strong jaws, but they don't chew their food. They swallow it in large chunks, and it is broken down in the stomach. Crocodiles can go for long periods without eating. There are, in fact, numerous examples of the animals not feeding for a whole year. They become extremely thin, but they're still active and are perfectly capable of feeding when food appears. Some species of crocodile can even tolerate freezing temperatures. This is because a crocodile has a very sophisticated circulatory system, with a heart more like a mammal's than a reptile's. Because crocodiles look like logs of wood, people assume, wrongly, that they will behave in the same way. However, studies have shown that crocodiles are quite complex socially. Individuals know other individuals and have long-term relationships with each other. They also learn very rapidly how to avoid dangerous situations. Some species can also become quite tame. One crocodile biologist, Frederico Medem, described a doctor in Colombia who had an Orinoco crocodile. He had raised it from a baby. This crocodile was a female about three meters long, and it played with the children and the family dog. Crocodiles of all species are threatened by many human activities. In the past, commercial over-exploitation by skin collectors and indiscriminate killing by frightened villagers have resulted in many species suffering drastic declines in numbers. But no species has become extinct because of human exploitation. However, what is most threatening the crocodile is destruction of its habitat. Because they are quite large animals, they require areas that are both large and diverse, and this brings them into conflict with local farmers and fishermen. One conservation project which is working well is with Nile crocodiles in the Okavango Delta in Botswana. Although the Nile crocodile is not listed as endangered, research suggests it should be. The number of nest sites has decreased by a third in the last 15 years. Fishermen destroy the nests, crocodile ranchers take their eggs, and also do not return enough juveniles to the wild, and there is now only one small part of the delta left where crocodiles can lay their eggs. To get data on the crocodiles in the area, researchers have measured, tagged, and taken blood samples from over 1,500 crocodiles, all without drugging the animals. They catch the crocodile by throwing a wet towel over its head. This is important, as a dry towel would come off too easily, thus allowing the crocodile time to escape. And they tie up its jaw with rubber bands. The animal is then released. Countries encountering a decrease in their crocodile population include Bangladesh, China, and Madagascar. Some other countries, such as Australia, have already taken steps to improve or create new habitats to positive effect. However, this has not always been the case elsewhere. The creation of dams and a new lakeshore has had little effect in Honduras and India because of drought or an increase in water use for agriculture. Zimbabwe, though, has seen an increase in numbers of its crocodiles because of expanded habitat. Too readily we have cast crocodiles as ruthless predators, feared them, misunderstood them, attacked and exploited them. But they are great survivors that go back more than 70 million years. We must do everything we can to make sure that crocodiles live on, looking and behaving much the same as they do today. That is the end of part four. 
You now have half a minute to check your answers.